Let's take a look at limiting reactant and percent yield. Both of these concepts use the stoichiometry that we looked at in the previous section. So the previous section we had one starting material and perhaps would calculate the grams of product that would form from that one starting material. In limiting reactant problems you have two different starting materials and you figure out which one is going to limit the amount of product that you're making. In a percent yield problem you are given an actual yield of product that you made and then you use the calculated theoretical yield as a point of comparison to figure out what percent you got from what you expected. Okay so let's look at this first example and the first thing we are doing are figuring out how many moles of product can be produced and we're giving both of the starting materials. So that is our clue that we are working on a limiting reactant problem because we have two different starting materials. So this is the process. We're going to figure out the amount of product produced for each of the starting materials separately. So let's go ahead and list our relationships. So here I've listed the relationship between aluminum chloride and aluminum and also the relationship between magnesium and aluminum. So what we need to do is figure out the moles of aluminum from both of these starting materials. Part A, we're going to convert moles of aluminum chloride into moles of aluminum. And part B, separately, we're going to convert moles of magnesium into moles of aluminum. All right, so this first part, 3.45 moles of aluminum chloride, we would use the relationship of moles of aluminum chloride to moles of aluminum, putting moles of aluminum chloride on the bottom so that we can cancel it out and we come up with 3.45 moles of aluminum. We have enough aluminum chloride to make 3.45 moles of aluminum. Then we have 4.68 moles of magnesium. We'll put the relationship so that the moles of magnesium cancel and we come out with 3.12 moles of aluminum. So even though it looks like we have more magnesium and less aluminum chloride, which is true, we do have fewer moles of aluminum chloride than magnesium, we need more magnesium to do the reaction than we do aluminum chloride. And it turns out that the magnesium is limiting us. Once we get to 3.12 moles of aluminum, we're going to run out of magnesium. We'll still have a little bit of aluminum chloride because we have enough to make 3.45 moles of aluminum with the aluminum chloride that we have the aluminum chloride is actually in excess. So that's the answer to part C. Magnesium is the reactant that is limiting because it's there's not enough to make 3.45 moles of aluminum. We're going to run out of magnesium first. And when we run out of magnesium, that's the amount of aluminum we're going to have. Even though we have a little bit more aluminum chloride to make more aluminum, it's not going to work because we don't have enough magnesium. We've run out of magnesium. So the amount that you can produce is going to be the smaller amount out of the two choices because that's when you run out of your first ingredient. So these first four parts are part of a limiting reactant type of problem. A lot of times people like the percent yield problem better because it actually has the words percent yield in the question. It doesn't really have the words limiting reactant in the question for the first part. So the percent yield means how much of what you should have gotten did you get. And just to let you know, you can do a percent yield problem without doing a limiting reactant problem. Um, you don't have to do both together. It's just that I had the reaction written, so I figured I would do both a limiting reactant and a percent yield problem on it you can do either one of these separately. For the percent yield, you don't need to have a limiting reactant. All you need is you need to know how much you should be producing and you need to know how much you did produce. So it's kind of like a quiz score. You have how much you're hoping for. You're hoping you get all 10 points on a quiz perhaps. And then you have your actual score. Maybe you got seven points on the quiz and then you can calculate the percent from there. So here you should have gotten 3.12 moles of aluminum. 
what you did end up getting is 2.87 moles of aluminum. It's very important that you compare the same item. So they say comparing apples to apples. So we want to compare moles to aluminum to moles of aluminum. We don't want to compare moles of aluminum to grams of aluminum or moles of aluminum to moles of aluminum chloride or moles of magnesium. Make sure these are the same item so that this can cancel and you're just left with percent in your answer and this ends up being 92.0%. So you did get most of what you were expecting. You didn't get 100% of what you were expecting, but it's pretty close. 2.87 out of 3.12 represents a 92% yield. So let's try a couple more examples. This problem, we are trying to figure out how many moles of sodium chloride can be produced. And we are given two different starting material amounts. We're told how much sodium carbonate we have and how much hydrochloric acid we have. So this is the hint that we have a limiting reactant problem. And so we want to calculate this answer, the moles of sodium chloride, twice, once for each starting material. Let's figure out what relationship we need to use so that we can write the correct conversion factor. So our ratio of sodium carbonate to sodium chloride is a 1 to 2 molar ratio. Our ratio of hydrochloric acid to sodium chloride is a 2 to 2 molar ratio. And I am getting that from the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. So I turn that first relationship into a conversion factor that has moles of sodium carbonate on the bottom to cancel out. And that gives me 1.72 moles of sodium chloride that can be produced from that amount of sodium carbonate. I have the second relationship written as a conversion factor with hydrochloric acid on the bottom and that gives me 1.24 moles of sodium chloride. So I have enough sodium carbonate to make 1.72 moles of sodium chloride but I only have enough hydrochloric acid to make 1.24 moles of sodium chloride so I'm going to run out of hydrochloric acid first. And when I run out of hydrochloric acid, I'm going to be done making sodium chloride. So this is the amount that I can produce of the sodium chloride. And I will still have a little bit of sodium carbonate left over after that happens. This next problem is very similar. It is also a limiting reactant problem. We are given both starting materials and we want to know the product that can be produced. I've written the relationships over here so I can use those as conversion factors. And I'm going to convert both of these separately, so I'm going to do two different calculations here. I write that first relationship as a conversion factor with lithium on the bottom, so that can cancel, and that gives me 1.28 moles of lithium nitride. And I write the second relationship as a conversion factor with nitrogen on the bottom, so that that cancels and leaves me with 3.64 moles of lithium nitride. So I have enough lithium to make 1.28 moles of product and enough nitrogen to make 3.64 moles of product. But once I get to 1.28 moles of product, I'm going to run out of lithium. And so I'm not going to be able to make the 3.64 moles of product. I'm going to run out of my first ingredient, my limiting reactant, once I hit 1.28 moles of product. So these smaller amounts are the amounts that you have enough materials to produce. Once you get there, that's when you run out of your first ingredient and that's when you are done with the reaction. So this next question relates to the previous question, 7.6.3. In the previous question, we found that we calculated 1.28 moles of lithium nitride could be produced. And so that is our theoretical amount there. So our percent yield is the actual amount we produced over what we theoretically should have been able to produce and then that fraction expressed as a percent. And it comes out to be 83.6 percent. Again it's important that these are the same units, the same item, so that you can compare it directly and also so the units cancel so this represents 83.6% of what we should have been able to make. 
All right, so for this one, I wanted to show you that you can do a percent yield problem without calculating a limiting reactant problem first. So here's a brand new equation, a brand new problem, and we are getting the percent yield. So the percent yield should be the actual amount over the theoretical amount times 100%. So let's see what actual amount we have here. We have that you did a reaction and you actually obtained 0.625 moles of calcium phosphate product. So that's what we actually got. So we put the actual amount, the 0.625 moles of calcium phosphate in the numerator. What we need to put in the denominator is the moles of calcium phosphate that we should get. So the denominator should be the moles of calcium phosphate that you should be able to get theoretically, the theoretical amount. We don't have given to us the moles of calcium phosphate that we should be able to get. What we have is the moles of starting material that we started with. So we're going to use this to figure out how many should this be able to make. So this is the question we need to answer before we know what to put in the denominator. How many moles of calcium phosphate should we be able to get if we do react 2.86 moles of calcium chloride. So let's use this space up here to figure out how many moles of calcium phosphate should be made. Here's our relationship between calcium chloride and calcium phosphate. And so 2.86 moles should be enough to make 0.953 moles of calcium phosphate. So this is what the denominator should be. 0.953 moles of the calcium phosphate is what is theoretically expected. So if we got 0.625 moles, this represents a 65.6% yield of what we had expected. So I did those previous examples on moles to try to show you what the process is. But of course, in lab, we usually know how many grams we put into the reaction, and we have to calculate how many moles from that. So this example here, we have both starting materials, the lithium and the nitrogen, and we wanna know how many grams of product we can produce. So this is a limiting reactant. And since we're working with grams, we are going to need the molar masses of the compounds involved. So I have these written over here. So let's figure out how many grams of product will come from 8.43 grams of lithium. We know the molar relationship between the lithium and the lithium nitride product. So first we have to convert this to moles. Then we have to stop talking about moles of lithium and start talking about moles of lithium nitride. So we'll put that molar ratio with the lithium on the bottom. So this first step cancels the grams of lithium, the second step cancels the moles of lithium, and the third step cancels the moles of lithium nitride to end up with the grams of product, the grams of lithium nitride that we want. And this ends up being 14.1 grams of lithium nitride. Following a similar process, we'll get from grams of nitrogen to moles of nitrogen using the molar mass of nitrogen, and then we'll use the molar ratio to get from moles of nitrogen to moles of lithium nitride. And finally, the molar mass will get from moles of lithium nitride to grams of lithium nitride, and this ends up being 12.0 grams of lithium nitride. So now that we've calculated both theoretical amounts that could be produced, the amount that really could be produced is the amount that you hit when you run out of your first ingredient. So the real answer to this problem isn't both of these answers. It is the smaller answer. So this is how much you can produce with the amount of starting material you have. And then when you get to this amount, you'll run out of one of the starting materials. So this 12 grams of lithium nitride is what you should be able to produce. If you try mixing these amounts and you only get 6.75 grams as the actual amount you get, 
then as a percent of what you should have gotten, this represents 56.3%. So this is less than you should have gotten by quite a bit. This next problem is one where we are finding the percent yield without having a limiting reactant problem. So we don't have both starting materials. We're not told how much oxygen we have. Hopefully we have plenty of oxygen around. We're just told how much we actually made. So we actually made 58.6 grams of iron three oxide. And the number that goes in the denominator is the theoretical grams of iron three oxide that you should be able to make. So we don't want to put the grams of iron in the denominator here. We're not, that wouldn't be a direct comparison. We need the grams of iron three oxide that should be made. We can use the grams of iron to figure that out. So let's figure out how many grams of iron three oxide we should be able to make with 42.6 grams of iron. To do that, we need the relationship that four moles of iron should make two moles of iron three oxide. And then we are also going to need some molar masses. Iron itself is 55.85 grams per mole. And iron three oxide is 159.70 grams per mole. So as a first step, we'll convert the 42.6 grams of iron into moles of iron. And then as a second step, we'll convert the moles of iron into moles of iron three oxide. And then the third step is to convert to grams of iron three oxide. So the answer to this question is that we should have enough iron to make 60.9 grams of iron three oxide. And that's what belongs in the denominator over here, that we should be making 60.9 grams of iron three oxide. We did make 58.6 grams of iron three oxide, and that represents a 96.2% yield for this reaction. All right, let's take a look at the final problem in this section. So here we are looking for grams of product and we are given both starting material amounts. We're given the grams of KOH and the grams of uh, tin to nitrate. So since we're given both starting materials, we know this is a limiting reactant problem. We're going to calculate the grams of product expected twice, once from the grams of tin to nitrate and a second time from the grams of potassium hydroxide. So let's go ahead and get some molar masses. I calculate that tin 2 hydroxide should be 152.73 grams per mole, tin 2 nitrate 242.73 grams per mole, and potassium hydroxide 56.11 grams per mole. So again, going through this three-step gram-to-gram conversion process, canceling the grams of tin 2 nitrate the moles of tin 2 nitrate and the moles of tin 2 hydroxide. I calculate that we have enough tin 2 nitrate to make 11.60 grams of tin 2 hydroxide. I think I'm going to have to erase this to have enough room for the second part. And then doing a gram to gram conversion for the second part, the 24.30 grams of potassium hydroxide with 56.11 grams per mole and two moles of potassium hydroxide per mole of tin 2 hydroxide that can be made. I end up with 33.07 grams of tin 2 hydroxide. So we have enough potassium hydroxide to make 33.07 grams of product. We have enough tin 2 nitrate to make 11.60 grams of product. The answer to this problem is going to be the smaller amount. That's when we run out of our first ingredient. So the answer to this question is 11.60 grams of tin 2 hydroxide.